Um, first, thank you for joining us, those who have already logged on. Um, we appreciate your uh, spending your evening with us. My name is Deb Kelly, for those of you who don't work with me, and I am one of the financial advisors with Potomac Financial Group, and we have a couple of other advisors here with us. Jeremy Dvorak, I'm certified financial planner at Potomac Financial Group. Chris Hill, Potomac Financial Group, the man with the plan. <laughs> okay. Um, so a, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. First, if you could take a look at your webinar control bar, it's either going to be at the very top or at the bottom of your screen, and then you want to move the mouse over it and click on the hand icon. And if you do that, we can see if you are, you know, raise your hand if you're hearing the audio, if you can hear us, um, that way we'll know who can and who cannot hear us. If you are having problems and you need to change your audio to the, you know, from computer to phone or vice versa, go ahead and click the arrow in audio settings um, and you should be able to change things there. And throughout this presentation, questions may arise. If you have any questions, you are gonna be able to submit them. Uh, at the bottom of the webinar control panel, you will see Q&A. Click on that, you can take your question. Uh, we will be looking at those throughout the presentation. And if you have a question and we can squeeze it in during the presentation, we will do so. Otherwise, we will address them at the end of the presentation. If for some reason we run long and aren't able to do so, one of us will certainly get back to you and answer your question. So go ahead, feel free to ask away. And Jeremy. Thanks, Deb. Um, so as planners, you know, we don't believe in leaving anything to chance, but we also can't be experts in every facet of financial planning, particularly with a subject like Medicare. It's just too much to know and too much changing on a constant basis. Um, so we want people to be informed, and we believe that the more important something is to you, the more control you should have over it, the more information. So these are our favorite kind of meetings because we get to sit back and let the experts talk. And we're grateful to have Tim Brady from Raymond James uh, talk about Medicare. He's our Medicare expert uh, in the home office. Um, so thank you, Tim, for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. And a little more on the introduction side. Um, as Jeremy just mentioned, Tim Brady is our guest speaker today, and he is with Raymond James uh, Wealth Planning Team. And he has amassed a wealth of exper experience throughout his years in the financial services field. So before he joined Raymond James in 2019, Tim worked at USAA as a financial advisor and as an investment services representative. Now he too is a certified financial planner uh, professional and he works closely with advisors like me, Jeremy and Chris to help us deliver consistent and holistic client advice uh, client service to our, our, to our clients. He holds three master's degrees, very impressive, one in business administration, another in management and leadership, both from Western Governors University, as well as a master's in American history from the American Military University. Uh, prior to joining the financial services field, Tim served in the U.S. Air Force uh, for 11 years, flying J-STARS aircraft, and spending over 750 hours supporting combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Thank you so much for your service, Tim. We all very much appreciate it. But when he's not flying radio control helicopters, you can find Tim cruising and spending time with his family. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tim. All right, thank you, Deb. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Uh, well, welcome everyone. And thank you for joining us today for a discussion around healthcare and retirement. Now, whether you're here for yourself or maybe here to help uh, gain information to, to help a, a loved one, this is a topic that many individuals do not plan adequately for. Or maybe they just don't understand the information enough because it's so overwhelming. So the goal of the presentation is to provide you with the information that you need to help prepare for the potential costs associated with Medicare. Now, what we'll cover today, we'll talk about the current landscape, um, and then we'll move into the four different parts of Medicare. We'll spend some time talking about the coverage options. Hopefully that uh, those slides will, will help eliminate a lot of the noise and the confusion uh, around your options. We'll talk about some enrollment periods and then finally at the, the end, the, the, the solvency of the, the Medicare system. Okay, so let's talk about the primary component of retiree healthcare, which is Medicare. It's health insurance for people 65 or older 
and for some individuals who are 65 who are under 65 with certain disabilities. Now, it's important to understand Medicare does not cover all of your health care expenses. Source uh, AARP, according to them, uh, they, they source that roughly 60% of your total health care costs are covered by Medicare. And the remaining 40% are out of pocket. Now, that remaining 40% are things like your co-pays, your deductibles, co-insurance, and just premiums for being in the system. Uh, now, before Medicare was enacted, only 25% of people had any type of meaningful uh, hospital insurance. And then upon the implementation of the Medicare system, hospital insurance coverage for, for those rose to almost 100%. So it certainly has improved access to, to health care for millions of retired Americans. Uh, again, it does not cover uh, dental, vision, hearing. It is not long-term care insurance. Uh, and there are premiums and deductibles and co-insurance that you still have to, uh, you still have to plan for. Now, just a, a couple of obligatory statistical slides here. Where does the source of Medicare come from? Now, we'll, it, it, this, this left bar is the entire Medicare system. Uh, the individual components, parts A, B, and D, we'll talk about C in a little while. But part A is your hospital insurance. That's funded primarily here through the payroll tax, this dark blue uh, bar. It's funded through our payroll tax by working. And then the rest is funded through taxation of Social Security, a little bit of interest on the Medicare trust fund, uh, and then the premiums. There's a small percentage of Americans who actually pay premiums for Part A. Parts B and D uh, are really uh, tax-based, tax-driven from our general tax revenue, as well as the premiums that you pay as the individual to enroll in those components. So a large portion of Part B is 72%, 71%, funded through general tax revenue. And then, uh, you know, the remaining funded through individual premiums. Now, if you're like most Americans, health care is expected to be one of your largest expenses in retirement after housing and transportation. But unlike, you know, your parents or previous generations, you may not have or most likely won't have access to employer or union sponsored health care. So these costs will likely consume a large portion of your retirement budget. And you need to plan for that. Now, depending on the source that you look at, uh, the, the average out-of-pocket cost for a, a couple who's 65 in 2020 through their lifetime of retirement, uh, you know, roughly 25 years or so, they can expect to spend almost $300,000 out-of-pocket on health care. The other thing to note, too, is depending on the source, um, you know, the health care inflation typically ranges anywhere from 4 to 6%. Uh, Fidelity estimated right around uh, 5%. Now, why are costs rising at a higher rate than normal inflation? You know, this year kind of being the, uh, you know, an aberration um, from the norm. Now, it's not that anything unusual is happening in the healthcare industry. I mean, medical technology is improving, but hospitals and physicians still need to get paid. People are still contracting diseases or need medical treatment. Um, but a lot of factors go into why the costs inflate higher than general inflation. Um, you know, one of the most expensive areas is medical technology. And according to CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, medical technology accounts for half of the spending growth in the healthcare industry. And the issue is not that technology itself is exceedingly expensive. It's that hospitals and healthcare administrators really have yet to figure out a, an efficient way to incorporate emerging technology with existing equipment. So you've got a piece of machinery that's only two years old, but the, the new software doesn't does function well with that, so therefore you have to replace the whole, you know, the whole system. So that that really drives up the cost of healthcare. Other things, of course, are going to be the uh, increase in prescription medications, uh, legal, the legal element of Medicare being lawsuits, billing fraud, um, retirees' healthcare habits. Maybe they're not living as uh, active as they were when they were uh, pre-retirement. And then, of course, the, the administrative cost of, uh, you know, such a large, uh, you know, just governmental system. So the, all these things add up together to show you, you know, why the cost of Medicare increases more than just general inflation. To give you uh, an estimate, too, uh, of someone new to Medicare, uh, this one's a little older, 2019. So someone new to Medicare on the left-hand side, they were, you know, they're looking to spend around $5,000. Uh, per year per person whereas someone who had been in the medicare system for 20 years you know their their costs rise up to closer to almost nineteen thousand dollars 
Uh, and the reason why is you look at the, the, the categories here, part B, your, your outpatient, your medical insurance is higher. Maybe you're going to the doctor more, uh, you know, the older that we get. Uh, or maybe you're needing more types of tests, such as uh, you know, immunizations or blood tests. Um, so that drives up a big cost of your Part B. Your Part D, of course, is your uh, prescription medication. Maybe you're taking uh, brand names instead of generics, or maybe you're, uh, you know, you're prescribed a, a larger number of medications. So those costs rise as well. Um, over here is your, uh, you know, your Medicare uh, supplement plans, also known as a Medigap. You know, to, to fill in the gaps that Medicare does not cover. Uh, so the premiums on those are, you know, they vary from state to state, but a lot of them are based on, on your individual's age. So, uh, you know, just like with auto insurance, if you have a, uh, that's not a, that's a bad example. So just know that the Medicare supplement may raise, uh, rise with age. And then vision and dental or uncertainties. Maybe you're, you're getting more um, eyeglass exams or eyewear exams or uh, needing more replacements uh, versus someone who is, uh, you know, 20 years younger. And then finally, one last uh, statistical slide here is, you know, where does the cost, where do I spend my healthcare dollars in retirement? On the left-hand side, you can see a large portion is made up of your co-pays, your medical expenses, your co-insurance, deductibles for going to the hospital and, and seeing doctors. And then as we come around counterclockwise down here on this light blue, uh, you know, the, the premiums to be in your uh, Part B and Part D components, that makes up a larger portion as well. And then finally, prescription medications make up the last 18%. Now, one thing to note is Medicare costs do vary based on geographic location. Uh, just an example here, Florida, uh, you can see a cost for a couple in Medicare, just over $12,000, whereas someone uh, out in Nebraska, uh, you know, just over $10,000. It's so a little bit of difference there based on geographic location. And this was based on uh, information gathered from CMS, or, uh, Centers for Medicare Services. So you know, many people do tend to look at this and uh, you know, where, you, where you live or end up in retirement can make a big uh, difference in your healthcare costs. So that was just a quick glance at the Medicare system. Let's really focus now into the individual parts of Medicare. We've got part A, which is your hospital insurance. And this helps pay for inpatient hospital stays, skilled nursing facility, home health care, and hospice care. Now, again, it's not long-term care. Part B is your medical insurance. This helps cover medically necessary services, doctor visits, outpatient care. It also covers many preventative services, such as screening and immunizations and, and diagnostic tests, as well as what's called durable medical equipment, things like wheelchairs and walkers. Now, these two components here, Part A and B, they make up what's called the Medicare system or original Medicare. So if you ever hear that phrase, original Medicare, it's these two components right here, Parts A and B. I'm going to skip Part C for a second and, and jump over here to Part D. That's your prescription drug medication uh, coverage. This helps pay for outpatient prescription drugs, and it may help lower your prescription drug costs uh, in protecting against higher retail costs in the future because you're essentially cost sharing with uh, an insurance provider. Now, Part C is, medic is what's known as a Medicare Advantage. It's essentially private insurance that takes the place of original Medicare, Parts A and B, but many Advantage plans also include Part D. So it, it takes these three components, Parts A, B, and D, and wraps it all up into one, uh, you know, one plan. And it, it's a private insurance company. So it, the cost of these is going to vary widely. We'll talk about that a little further. But just know that this is a, really kind of a subset from parts A, B, and D. OK, so go, to go a little further into the details of each part, again, part A is your hospital insurance. It covers hospital inpatient care, skilled nursing facility, home health care, and hospice care. Now, most individuals do not pay a monthly premium for part A if they themselves or their spouse has 10 years of Medicare covered employment. If, if you or your spouse don't meet those requirements or you know, if you're single and you, and you didn't have 10 years of work, um, then, then there is a premium of up to $471 uh, for those without sufficient work credits. Now, one thing I'll note right here is these numbers are all based on 2021. So they haven't released 2022's numbers yet. So um, and just, just be mindful of that. 
So for part A, again, most most uh, participants don't have a, a monthly premium because they're you know they themselves or their spouse had at least 10 years of work. Now, once you're admitted, you have to be actually formally admitted. You can't just be kept overnight. That doesn't count for Medicare Part A uh, coverage. But once you're formally admitted, then you enter what's called these uh, the cost sharing, uh, the co-insurance essentially of of the different uh, really level of days that you stay. So for days one through 60, if you're admitted to a hospital, you pay the deductible, which is the first $1,484. Whether you pay that you know, over 10 days, you know, if, if, it, if it costs 10 days to equal $1,484 or it, costs, it takes 20 days, you pay that deductible first. And then the rest of the days in this period, uh, there's, no, there's no additional uh, out-of-pocket cost. Once you get to days 61 through 90, you as the individual participant pay $371 per day. Now there's also a lifetime reserve of uh, 60 additional days. If you, you know, once for those that are lifetime reserve days, you pay $742 per day, whether you use them all at once or you use them incrementally over many different years. You have this lifetime reserve of 60 days. So if you stay, maybe let's say you're admitted to the hospital, you stay 95 days, you know, that you can take five from here and move them over to here, and that leaves you with 55 more lifetime days. So for those reserve days, you pay $742 per day. After that, after you've exceeded all your uh, lifetime reserve days, you pay all costs uh, for the hospital stay. Now, that can be very expensive, especially with, uh, you know, experience uh, COVID, people had, you know, one, two million dollar hospital bills. So that, that's very expensive. Uh, component of Medicare. Now, one thing to note is uh, the term benefit period. Now, a benefit period begins the day you're admitted to one of these facilities, either a home, uh, I'm sorry, a hosp uh, hospital or skilled nursing facility, um, and it ends the day uh, if you haven't received care for 60 days in a row. So, an example would be you're admitted to the hospital January 1st, you stay for 10 days, and you're readmitted um, February 1st, you're still within that same benefit period, meaning you don't have to pay this deductible again. You're still in these windows of time. Conversely, if you're admitted January 1st, you stay for 10 days, and then you're readmitted September 1st, you, net, you now start a whole new benefit period. You pay the deductible again, and then you move into the, the different days of service. So it's just something to be mindful of. Um, you know, I guess technically there is a limit of benefit periods because there's a, a finite number of days in a calendar year. But, you know, for someone who had been admitted, readmitted, uh, released, readmitted, re you know, released and so forth, they could have this deductible three, four, five times over. Okay, a little bit more deeper into medical insurance, the part B. This is your outpatient care, doctor visits, outpatient medical services, your uh, preventative care, labs, and the durable medical equipment. Now, the premium for Part B varies based on your income. It can vary anywhere from $148.50 all the way up to almost $500 per person per month. And it, essentially, it's a way of means testing those who, who retire with high income um, to pay more into the Medicare system. Just like with Part A, you pay a deductible. You pay the first $203 out of pocket. So an example here would be, let's say you go to the doctor, it's $100. So you pay the first $100, you go again a second time, another $100. You go a third time, well, rather than pay $100, you pay $3. And then the other 97% gets shared between you, or the other $97 gets shared between you and Medicare. You pay 20% of that $97 and Medicare covers the other 80%. So once you meet the deductible, you move into coinsurance. Now, if you're in Medicare, there is no out of limit max, out of pocket max, because, I mean, I guess technically there is, uh, you know, the Medicare will cover 80%, whereas you as the individual would cover the other 20%, but that 20% is up to an unlimited amount. So if you get a, a million dollar uh, doctor bill, then you're responsible for 20% of that million dollars. So it's just something to be mindful of. Uh, and, and that's where a lot of the, maybe the over-reliance on Medicare, hey, they cover 80%, I only need 20%. Um, and just remember that 20% is up to an unlimited ceiling. 
Now, just uh, you know, just a quick glance of some of the services covered by Medicare Part B. This is not all inclusive, but again, many screenings, exams, uh, immunizations, and labs, uh, and so forth. Now, this chart shows a little more in detail as far as the the surcharge. It's called an income-related monthly adjustment amount, an IRMA. What Medicare does is they look at your income and your tax filing status from two years prior to determine your Part B and subsequently your Part D monthly premium. So for someone who retires uh, married filing jointly, they retire, they make $800,000 a year, so they're over this limit. Their Part B premium per person per month is just you know almost $500 a month. And they may say, well, I, you know, I retired making $800,000 a year. Now my income has dropped to $150,000. Well, the good news is after two years of paying this premium, you're going to move down to this premium. So it's dynamic. It's fluid. You're not stuck into this, this premium forever uh, unless you're making over $750,000 know, every year. Now, the other thing to, to be mindful of is it, it, it can work the other way. You know, you retire, you make $150,000, you're paying this premium. You reach age 72, you start taking RMDs from your IRA, and now you're up to $300,000 a year because of your RMD. Well, now your premium has come down to this level because you're, you're married filing jointly and you're, you're earning a $300,000. So now you're paying a higher premium. So this is, you know, not to go too much into IRA spending and things like that, but it, it, it's something to be mindful of if you have large, large uh, traditional IRAs, maybe that's where the strategy of utilizing Roth conversions earlier in your retirement, uh, so that way you don't have an RMD uh, and then have higher Medicare premiums later on in life. But really, uh, to focus around the Medicare conversation, just know that your Part B premiums are dynamic and they're based on your income. Now, when is Part B required? You must have Part B if you want to purchase an individual Medigap plan or a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, for those retired military, uh, military and they're eligible for TRICARE for life, they still have to enroll in Part B. If you're in a, a CHAMP VA, which is essentially uh, VA benefits for spouses, they still have to enroll in Part B uh, because VA, VA benefits are separate from Medicare. Medicare is essentially the primary insurance. And then TRICARE for life and, and VA uh, provides additional benefits. If you don't enroll when first eligible, you could pay late enrollment penalties. And unfortunately, these penalties are lifetime. Um, now, if you're actively working past age 65 and your employer has less than 20 employees, you're required to enroll in, uh, in Medicare. If you have more than 20 employees, you can delay as long as you have that group, group insurance. So for, for small employers, uh, or employees, if you have questions about it, certainly talk to your union or benefits, um, okay. you know, administrator, just to make sure that uh, you know they they inform you of your options, so you're not enrolling late and paying penalties. Now, just like I did earlier, I'm going to skip Part C. We're going to talk about Part D again. This is your prescription drug insurance. Even Medicare's website says enrollment is voluntary, but just like with Part B, there's penalties for enrolling late. These plans are offered by private insurance companies. And uh, the, formula, the drug formularies and pharmacies, they vary uh, by insurance carrier and vary you know, plan to plan. The monthly premium, uh, anywhere from $33 to $43. Um, just like with Part D, there's a surcharge. And just like with the other components, uh, I'm sorry, with Part B, there's a surcharge. And uh, just like every other component, there's a, there's a deductible. You pay the first $445 out of pocket. So going back to this chart, focusing on Part D, let's say, again, you retire, making 800000 married filing jointly, so you're over this level. You pay the plan premium of the, the drug plan, but then you also pay this additional surcharge. So this one is really more of a true surcharge. Uh, and again, it's based on your two years prior, so it is dynamic. Now, just to give an example of my dad, I think he pays like 9 or $10 for his uh, Part D plan. He's not a high income earner, so he's he's only paying the nine dollars. But if he were if he were a high income earner, he would pay the nine plus this eighty seven. So he'd pay you know almost eighty six dollars a month. Now, what is Part D? You know, what are the costs associated with Part D? Um, after twenty twenty, this this donut hole coverage gap filled up. 
and, and what used to happen is once you reach this this donut hole right here, you as the individual would have to pay 100% of the cost of the drug until you reach this, you know, there's ever levels. After 2020, they, you know, Medicare uh, and through legislation, they just said, we're going to close that donut hole. Um, you pay your deductible and then you reach your initial coverage period, you pay 25%. And then you're paying basically 25% for either generic or brand name drugs all the way up until this, uh, this 6550 threshold. Now, that 6550 threshold is the total out of pocket cost between you as the individual and the insurance plan. So don't think that you have to spend, you know, $6,500 in a year before you reach this catastrophic coverage phase. Um, and I don't like I don't like the terminology of that, but that's just what they call it. Once you and the plan spend $6,500 or $6,550 on medications, you then enter this catastrophic coverage phase, and you would pay only a small surge, you know, essentially 5% of the retail cost of a medication. Not everyone's going to enter this catastrophic phase. I would say that most, most who do are typically taking some type of injectable drug or uh, uh, rheumatoid, rheumatoid medications um, can, can cost pretty much. Um, so that those type of medications can get you up to this, uh, you know, this catastrophic level. Now that we've covered parts A, B, and D, where are there gaps, you know, things that you have to pay for out of pocket still? Well, you have to pay all of your deductibles, you know, parts A deductible, parts B deductible, uh, your part D deductible. You have to pay the coinsurance, you know, the 80% the for your part B that Medicare covers, you pay the other 20%. Uh, the coinsurance of, you know, the per day cost for hospital stays, uh, as well as any skilled nursing facility or hospice co-pays. You're not covered by Medicare if you have emergency care abroad, uh, unless you're closer uh, to the Canadian or Mexican border and it's closer to go to one of those uh, facilities versus a US facility. And then finally, this Part B excess charge. You may say, well, what, what is that? Well, legally, a provider can charge 15% over the Medicare assigned rate. So for example, if a procedure costs $100, the doctor can charge $115. Medicare covers $100. The other 15, it does not cover, you would be responsible for 100% out of pocket for that extra $15. $15. And it's legal. Um, but just know that, you know, uh, when you're looking at providers, kind of what their what their practices are and what their, uh, you know, what their, their costs uh, typically range from. So these are things out of pocket. Whenever you get medical care, you have to pay these. Well, how can you how can you offset those? Well, you can look at what's called a Medigap plan, also known as a Medicare supplement. The, they, they mean the same thing, they're just interchangeable terminology. They're offered by private insurance carriers to help reduce all of those out-of-pocket costs I just mentioned. They're broken down in two letters, you know, just to add more confusion, you know, with 10 different letters, A through N, um, and they, they vary in coverage based on the letter. And, and then the premiums vary significantly by geography, age, insurance provider, and you know the letter that you choose. Now, up until 2020, Plan F was the most comprehensive, uh, meaning it covered all of those things I just uh, I, I just mentioned back in this slide, with even uh, the ability to cover some limited emergency care abroad. So it would cover all these things. Now, the thing to note, though. With Medicare supplements, you have a premium that you paid it to, to buy into this policy on a monthly basis. So you may pay more up front, but you may have little to no out of pocket costs on the back end whenever you get medical care. One thing to note when you're shopping for Medicare supplement policies is they, they're uh, regulated by Medicare. So a Medicare supplement plan F or G or whatever letter through Humana is going to have the exact same coverage as. Uh, the same Medicare supplement with Aetna or Blue Cross Blue Shield. So it really does come down to the cost of that policy as well as the customer service, right? Is it worth paying a little, you know, 10 extra dollars, <clears throat> excuse me, for better customer service, you know, and for somebody to help you when you need that help. <clears throat> All right, so just a quick chart on the different Medigap plans. Really the most common ones that I've seen are uh, A, F, G, and N. Uh, I think I saw one K or L back when I sold Medicare plans uh, you know, a few years ago. So A, uh, G, and uh, N. 
with with F going away, not necessarily going away, but anyone new to Medicare after 2020, they can no longer enroll in Plan F. So Plan G is kind of taken over as the most comprehensive level. You can see the only thing that that separates those is you pay that first $203 for Part B. Remember, you have a deductible for Part B uh, with with this Medicare supplement. You pay that, and then after that, everything else um, you know that Medicare doesn't cover for Part B, the supplement will will cover. So it really does leave you with very limited out-of-pocket costs um, for your Medicare services. Now, one thing to note, though, if Medicare doesn't cover it, the Medicare supplement doesn't cover it. So Medicare does not cover hearing, dental, or vision, does not cover long-term care, and it does not cover prescription medication. So therefore, Medicare supplement does not cover these things, <clears throat> unless they're medically necessary, such as, let's say, you have cataracts and you need cataract surgery. That would be a medically necessary you know, vision procedure, and that's where Medicare would cover it. Otherwise, uh, routine eye exams or routine dental cleanings, those are not covered. You would have to purchase those type of insurances separately. So as you can see, these costs, you know, they really, really start to add up and they're coming from all over the place. How do we, how do we help kind of manage those and, and consolidate those uh, into one? Well, hence part C, coming in back into Medicare Advantage. These are private insurance alternatives for Medicare. All Medicare Advantage plans by law cover parts A and B. Most, however, will also include prescription medication. They'll also include dental benefits, vision benefits, hearing benefits, as well as even free gym memberships. Now, you may have uh, networks to, to consider. And uh, the, pl the plan cost and structure vary significantly there you can't even put this all on a slide on how they vary i've got one example i'll show you in here in a few minutes but just know the cost and the structure for medicare advantage plans uh, they do vary widely you still have to pay your part b premium but rather than that money go to the government it gets transferred over to the, the insurance carrier it does at least provide a ceiling as far as your out-of-pocket cost <clears throat> more restrictive networks you have lower out-of-pocket costs because you have to stay in that network and then, you know, more lenient networks, uh, you may have higher out-of-pocket costs. They may give you the flexibility to go out of network. And with that, you may have, you may have to, you know, pay a higher, um, you know, higher amount. But at least, it does at least provide some type of ceiling. So that way, if you have some catastrophic event or catastrophic year, uh, you know, you're not paying hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical care. So, like I said, with, with Advantage plans, uh, they are private insurance alternatives. They do typically have networks, and, and networks often have a negative connotation with them. But when you shop for these plans, it's a very – there's a lot of discovery that goes into uh, healthcare conversations with, um, you know, insurance carriers and providers. <laughs> and they're going to ask you, who are your doctors? What pharmacies do you prefer to go to? If all of those providers are in – that that network, even if it's a restrictive network of all of those providers are in that network, it may not be a big deal. Um, you may be fine going out of network, or I mean, staying in that network, with the the peace of mind knowing that you have a lower maximum out of pocket. So there's really two networks to consider: an HMO, which is a health maintenance organization, typically a little more restrictive, a little more regionalized. PPO is a preferred provider organization, uh, typically more flexible. So you can see. Um, you, know, you may have higher copays down here for going out of pocket in a PPO. With an HMO, you have to have you have to go on network, except in an emergency, and you have to have a primary care physician who refers you for specialists. Uh, whereas a PPO, you don't you don't need those things. And then pretty much everything else, drug coverage, dental, and vision, uh, they're going to be very similar. So here's the example. Um, you know, of cost structure as far as what you would pay as the individual, um, you know, to, to, to be in this plan. You know, what is an ambulance cost? What do you pay if you're admitted to a hospital? Um, you know, for medical supplies or screenings or lab work. So when you're doing these things, you know, the, the, the insurance provider is going to provide you basically line item by line item cost um, to show you what your out-of-pocket uh, uh, cost would be. Medicare Advantage is going to look a lot lower on a monthly basis from a premium standpoint. 
and you may even you may have even seen commercials. Uh, you know, get money back into your Social Security by enrolling in a Medicare Advantage. Well, what they're doing is they're reimbursing you part of your Part B premium. I've seen all the way up to a hundred dollars. So if you're paying one hundred forty-eight dollars for your Part B, you know, to, to 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 cover the premium, they reimburse you a hundred dollars every month. Your net cost for Part B now is forty-eight dollars. But what you have to consider, what are the cost sharing? Does it cost you twenty percent, uh, you know, versus ten percent with with the Medicare Advantage plan that that reimburses you versus one that doesn't? Right? It, it, it may seem like a good deal to always get that reimbursement, but maybe they're charging you more whenever you go get medical care. So, kind of a key takeaway when it comes to Medicare Advantage, you just have to look at the deductibles what the doctor fees are and what you pay as the individual, whether it's a fixed dollar amount or a percentage of the total cost. And then of course, what happens if you're hospitalized. So just a flow chart on you know, how the money goes, you still pay your Part B premium. It goes to the Medicare insurance provider. They basically start, they handle all the uh, you know, marketing and billing and so forth. Um, so it really streamlines your, uh, your contact with who you pay and who you talk to whenever you have a question. You typically have one company to, to, uh, you know, to coordinate with. All right, so here's a slide I really hope kind of simplifies all of the, uh, you know, the informational noise, right? Especially right now during, during the annual enrollment period, you see commercials uh, from one insurance provider that, that say, you know, enroll in Medicare Advantage because it offers additional benefits. You get money back into your social security and that's the best way to go. Five minutes later, you'll see another commercial from the same insurance provider, maybe a different spokesperson, saying, hey, enroll in a Medicare supplement because it gives you more benefit. You know, more benefits, you have no co-pays whenever you go get medical care. <clears throat> so it can be overwhelming. The first step for, for anything is you have to enroll in the original Medicare system, parts A and B. Once you do that, you'll get this red, white, and blue card. Many people do this at the same time. For those who are working past 65, maybe they enroll in Part A now, and then they enroll in Part B three or four years later when they're done working, and then they'll get reissued a new uh, new Medicare card. Once you have both parts of Medicare, your option then would be, do I do I keep the original Medicare and come down this left side of the chart by adding a standalone uh, drug plan, adding a Medigap policy because I don't want to be on the hook for that other 20% that Medicare doesn't cover. And then I add dental and vision, right? So I've got all these, these a la carte insurance coverages, but whenever I get medical care, I don't have to pay anything. I don't get a bill in the mail. That's all handled. Um, so that's, that's the option if you keep original Medicare and add everything standalone. The other option, again, you enroll in Medicare system, but now you turn it over to a private insurance carrier like Aetna or Humana, and you enroll in a Medicare Advantage. Now you have one company to work with. All of your coverage is wrapped up into one, uh, you know, one plan. You don't have to worry about buying separate dental or vision and so forth. Now you, you may, it may not necessarily cover all of your dental or vision. It may only cover, you know, $200 a year for dental care, but maybe that's better than, you know, better to you than paying a, a monthly premium. So it's not that one path is better than the other. You know, think about this path over here on the right, on the left side, I mean, as pay me now, right? I'm gonna pay more on a monthly basis, but uh, I don't wanna deal with anything on, on the back. Whereas this side of the chart is more of the pay me later. Maybe I don't go to the doctor very often. Why do I wanna pay a premium? Maybe I wanna, uh, you know, I'm okay with networks um, and I just want one insurance provider to deal with. I want a lower monthly premium, um, you know, and, and maybe I'm okay paying the out of pocket whenever I do go to a dent, uh, you know, doctor. So, you know, that, that is really the two choices that you have when it comes to Medicare. Um, and I, I hope that helps, you know, simplify it a little bit. The things to consider when it comes to the original Medicare system, and, and this may be, you know, a deciding factor if you travel a lot, you have the flexibility to receive care from any doctor or hospital that accepts Medicare. So if you live... I don't know, let's say up in uh, Michigan six months out of the year and then down in Florida six months you know, out of the year, you're, you're not restricted to those geographic locations. You can go to any, any doctor that accepts Medicare. Now, if you don't have a Medicare supplement, 
you know, you're going to be responsible for that additional 20% out of pocket, uh, you know, up to the, the, the ceiling of no, no ceiling. And then, you know, if you need dental or vision or hearing, you got to purchase all those separately. The pros of Medicare Advantage uh, that many people like is it's convenience of one plan. You have a question about your billing. You have a question about who to go see for a certain uh, provider. You know, you can typically log into their website and search providers in the area. Um, you do have at least some out-of-pocket limit. You know, even though $11,000 or so is, is still quite high, it does at least provide you with that, you know, that coverage or that, that ceiling in a catastrophic scenario. And it does, you know, many include dental, vision, hearing, and, and gym memberships. Things to consider with Medicare Advantage, network of doctors and hospitals. If you do go out of network, if you're allowed to, um, you know, may have higher costs. And then, of course, those, those plans and benefits can or may change each year. Not that they're going to, but they're, you know, they're, they may change each year. And, and this uh, Medicare Advantage plan that works for you this year or maybe the next five years may not necessarily be the one you're in 10 years from now. So, you know, as we're, as we're talking right now, we're, we're right in the middle of uh, the annual enrollment period. And it, the, the annual enrollment period is really designed for Medicare Advantage participants. Um, it starts uh, October 15th through December 7th. If you enroll during that period of time or you have coverage changes during that period of time, they don't take effect until January 1 of next year. <clears throat> what you can do during this time of year is you... You can join a Medicare Advantage plan. Let's say you were on governmental Medicare the first half of the year, uh, and now you, you know, you're kind of looking at your options and you want to consider a Medicare Advantage. You can join one during this time of year. You uh, you can switch from one Medicare Advantage to another, so maybe uh, from Humana or Aetna. Uh, you can go from original, well, I guess this bullet point here, switch from original Medicare to an Advantage, which is kind of what I just said. You can go the other way. You can go from a Medicare Advantage back to the original Medicare. So maybe you retired and you, you said, hey, I want to I try out a Medicare Advantage plan because I don't really want to pay a, a large premium because I retired making high income uh, or something like that. Um, you know, but maybe you, you, you found that you're traveling more than you uh, originally thought and, and you need the flexibility to go, you know, to go uh, anywhere in the U.S. So maybe you, you're switching from an Advantage to a Medicare. You can sign up, drop, or change uh, Part D plans. Now this, this bullet point here, sign up for a Medigap plan, that's not limited to, to only this time of year. You can actually sign up for Medigap plans or change in Medigap plans anytime throughout the year. Uh, but I, I put this here just because it's, it's typically on people's mind. Right? It, 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 they see the commercial around a Medigap and uh, you know, it kind of you know, sets off a light that, hey, I need, to, I need to review my Medicare coverage. <clears throat> so what are the, I mean, there's many enrollment periods. I mean, unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, because that adds further complexity and, and, and things to you know, keep in mind. I would say the, the first uh, in period that hits people is the initial enrollment, right? They're, they're turning 65. That initial enrollment window opens three months prior to the month of their 65th birthday. It includes the month of their 65th birthday and then three months after. So you have a seven month window to enroll in Medicare if you don't have any other group insurance. So now the coverage, you know, if, if you enroll, let's say your birthday was, uh, um, I don't know, August, um, August, so you go back three months, you enroll uh, three months prior, the coverage isn't actually going to start, you know, until August 1st. So, you know, you can at least get the administrative stuff out of the way three months you know, prior, but the coverage doesn't start until you turn 65. And then if you wait till 65 or, you know, within this three months later, it starts the month after you, you enroll. Now, this six month here, this is important to note for those who are considering a Medigap plan, the Medicare supplements, because this is a guaranteed insurability period, meaning you cannot be denied coverage or you know, a Medigap policy for any type of health conditions. So you retire at 65, you say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay on the Medi Medicare system, but I'm going to add the supplement policy. It's important to keep the six month window because if you enroll in month seven, in a Medigap, the insurance provider can ask you additional underwriting questions. They can deny you coverage for, you know, uh, medical conditions. And they may even say, hey, we, we can't insure you for at least two years until we see a, a you know, clean bill of health, you know, let's say a heart attack or something. 
uh, until you have no reported incidents for two years. So for, again, this, this is really important for someone who is considering a Medigap policy, the six month guaranteed insurability period. We've already talked about this annual election period. Um, I'll just say this, this went away, this Medicare disenrollment went away, so we're not even worried about that. The general enrollment period, let's say something happened. And there was a scenario I just talked with an advisor uh, a couple of weeks ago. They had a uh, client who retired and uh, were, was on COBRA, and they forgot to enroll in Medicare within you know this this initial period because COBRA doesn't count. <clears throat> well, now they have to wait until January of next year to enroll. They have the window of time between January and March to enroll in Medicare. Their coverage though doesn't start until July 1st, so. Uh, you know, fortunately though, their COBRA ends, you know, June 30th of next year, and, and you know the the Medicare picks up, you know, July 1st. Now, because they enrolled late, they're subject to penalties. So this is essentially a second window of time. If you, you know life happens, something happens, you forget about it. You have a second window of time to enroll in Medicare. Just know that if you enroll during this period of time, the coverage doesn't start until July 1st. Hey, Tim, real quick, yep. just to clarify on that. So if somebody misses that six-month window for a, a Medigap plan and they do have pre-existing conditions of some kind, for the rest of their lives, that pre-existing condition theoretically could be disallowed or not covered. Is that right? Well, it, yeah, the, the insurance provider may say, okay, you had a chronic condition. And I don't have to think of any only example I can think of right now is a heart attack or something. But let's say you have a heart attack now and then three years from now you have another one. You know, they may say, okay, we can't insure you. Um, you know, you can't be denied health care for, for that, but we can't insure you for the, you know, under a Medigap until you have two years of, uh, you know, clean health. And does that apply for Medicare Advantage also? No, Medicare Advantage is different. Um, you can't be denied for pre existing conditions under Medicare Advantage. Okay. Yeah, good well, that's huge, though, that if you miss that six, months, one, six month window. Yeah, so that's important for those who are, you know, are considering going the Medi uh, Medigap route, the six-month yeah. guaranteed insurability. And it's not necessarily from your 65th birthday. Uh, it, it's from when you have your Part A and B effective dates. So for someone who works until they're 68 years old, maybe they maintain their group insurance until, you know, kind of just replace the 65 with 68. They, they, they retire from work. They lose their group insurance. Now they're in Medicare. They have a six-month window from, from that termination date. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. So penalties for late enrollment, uh, different for the different parts. Uh, part B, there is a 10% premium for each 12 month. So that person I had talked to you about uh, who, who was on COBRA, they're having to pay a 10% uh, premium, you know, uh, every month now for the rest of their life because they had a, a full 12 month period of no enrollment. So you know, $148, 10%, that's an extra, you know, almost $15 a month forever. Part D uh, is a 1% premium uh, for each month that you in, you delay enrollment. Now, this the 63 days, um, you know, this is really based off your Part A. Um, you, you need Part A to actually enroll in a drug plan. Um, if you have uh, credible drug coverage through an employer, the 63 days starts once you lose your um, uh, group insurance. But again, the main takeaway is if you if you enroll late, there's a 1% premium increase for each month. Now, I, when I was selling Medicare, Medicare plans, there was a, a client who called in. They were uh, 85 years old looking to enroll in a prescription medication plan because they didn't enroll when first eligible. They didn't take any medications. So they, you know, today they said, why am I going to pay for it you know, if I don't actually use it and I don't take any medication? Well, 20 years later, uh, you know, this, this premium increased. Uh, it was almost too too prohibitive for them to uh, to enroll. They just they just decided not to enroll in a Part D plan. So I mean I guess they're never going to pay the penalty. But now if they get medications, they have to pay the full retail cost for them. So uh, just keep in mind, penalties are lifetime. Now, when can you delay enrollment? Right? What if what if you're still working? There's there's times that you can delay enrollment. The, the most common being when you have group health insurance, either through yourself or your, your spouse who is still working, and it's considered uh, creditable, meaning it's at least as good as Medicare's. I don't know of many employer health care plans that aren't as good as Medicare's, um, but that's the way they word it. The insurance has to be at least as good as Medicare's or better, 
And once that coverage ends, you then have what's known as a special enrollment period. You have up to eight months to enroll in Medicare Parts A and B and 63 days to enroll in Parts uh, uh, D without penalty. <clears throat> so that's the most common time or you know, post, most common scenario to delay enrollment is you're still working, you, you or your spouse, and you have that group health insurance. Now, the, another you know, consideration is um, if you're enrolled in Medicare, even Part A, while you're, if, let's say you're, part, you're working, you're enrolled in Part A because it doesn't cost anything, uh, you cannot contribute to an HSA account. Now, you can use the dollars that are in an HSA to, to pay for approved Medicare services. You just can't add any new dollars. And for those who are receiving Social Security, they're automatically enrolled in Parts A and B, which means they can no longer contribute to an HSA. And the reason, you know, the legal reason is right here. To contribute pre-tax dollars to an HSA, you cannot have any health insurance to include Medicare other than a high deductible health care plan. So for those who are still working uh, and they have an HSA that they want to contribute to, that's a big uh, consideration for really not uh, not to enroll in Part A, you know, if they can, if they're not taking Social Security. Now, you know, being eligible for Medicare, just turning 65 or you know 67, and you have just being eligible for Medicare doesn't disqualify you from HA, making HSA contributions. It's once you actually enroll in any part of Medicare. And like I said, if you're working past 65, you have creditable coverage. You haven't signed up for Social Security you can forego part A and contribute to the HSA. Now, as you can see down here, be careful about the contributions in the year that you're, you're planning to leave your job and, and, and signing up for Medicare because HSA contributions are prorated for the months that you have your group health insurance. So if you work January through August, you leave your company in August, you enroll in Medicare starting in September, they take the annual contribution limit of an HSA and they divide it by eight months, you know, January through August, and say, okay, you can only contribute X dollars because you only had that group insurance for eight months. So just something to be mindful of. Uh, the year you plan to retire, if you're making HSA contributions, uh, you know, just work with the you know, work with the advisor to to make sure you don't make an excess contribution. <clears throat> All right. So again, uh, not to add, you know, another. Enrollment period is a special enrollment period. This really doesn't have any type of calendar uh, association tied to it. it it's based on a, a you know circumstance. The most common being you're working past 65. Uh, another one is you, know, you have other health insurance. Maybe you maybe you retire uh, for a couple of years. You go into Medicare and then you go back to work. Um, you can actually drop your Medicare and go back on to group health insurance. And then once you leave you know, that second time you know, you have this, this special enrollment period. If you change address uh, outside of a planned service area or their plan changes the contract with Medicare, this isn't this time of year type of thing. You know, many plans are changing for next year. This is more, hey, your, your plan is changing uh, mid-year. You know, maybe they're, maybe they're dropping a, a doctor or a, a pharmacy because of whatever business relationship. Um, so that, that falls under a special enrollment period. And then, uh, you know, Kind of a least common one is a mistake made by a Medicare employee. Now, you know, the periods last for eight months and it begins the month after your employer sponsored healthcare coverage ends, um, you know, whichever happens first. And then the Part D is for 63 days. Now, this, this one's important and this kind of leads into that example. Uh, COBRA healthcare coverage is not considered to be primary coverage once you turn 65. So, Medi you can have COBRA um, and Medicare at the same time. I really don't know, you know why you would. It's pretty cost prohibitive. Um, but just know that uh, uh, Medicare becomes your private insurance carrier, therefore requires you to enroll once you turn 65 if you're on COBRA. <clears throat> All right. What are some of the mistakes that we can help you avoid here? You know, we talked about believing Part A and B is enough coverage. It may, you know, it may seem like it covers 80%. But, you know, way back to the beginning of the presentation, uh, you still, you know, Medicare typically covers around 60% of your total health care costs. So um, it may not necessarily be enough coverage. 
Number two is important, not pricing out uh, prescription medication plans independent of your spouse, just because uh, you know, a plan with Aetna works for you. Um, based on your medications, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the, the right plan for your spouse. Um, so they really wanna uh, find plans based on their medications. Number three is failing to reevaluate during this open enrollment period to include any Part D coverage. You don't have to necessarily have to make a change, but just like with anything in retirement, Medicare is not a set it and forget it. You at least want to spend you know, a couple hours uh, you know, to, to, to review your health care coverage, make sure it's meeting your needs, uh, or you know, if your life has changed at all, maybe you're, you're traveling less or you're traveling more, is the coverage you have still adequate for your lifestyle? Um, number three, I'm mean, sorry, number four kind of kind of ties into number one is, you know, you know, not thinking about a Medigap plan when you're on original Medicare because of that, um, you know, the out-of-pocket cost. Uh, number five, you know, this one takes a little bit of time. I guess it still kind of ties into three is not comparing the costs and features of original Medicare and Medicare Advantage. You know, you, you know when it comes to the Medicare Advantage, the, you know, those calls can take you know, those conversations I should say can take two or three hours with an insurance provider to, to really go through, you know, what is the ambulance ride cost? What is the, uh, you know, what is the percent copay whenever I go to a doctor or a specialist? So it can take a little bit more legwork. Um, again, it doesn't mean you have to do anything. You don't have necessarily always have to change year over year. But, you know, the key takeaway is look at your coverage and does, does it still meet your, you know, your medical needs as well as your financial capabilities. Number six, we don't have a crystal ball, um, you know, you know, but no insurance provider is going to know your own health better than you. You know, they probably have statistics that, you know, that that know us better than us, but they're not going to know your individual health care, you know, your family health care and so forth. Um, so think about, you know, conditions in your your, your own family and uh, as much as you can uh, towards future health care needs. And then number seven is not seeking expert help. Um, you know, Medicare is a very complex system. Uh, but don't think you have to go at it alone. Some additional enrollment mistakes to avoid is failing to sign up for Medicare um, because you aren't taking Social Security. So if you're delaying, meaning if you're if you're delaying Social Security until you're 70, you still have to keep in mind: Do you have other insurance? Right? If you retire from work at 65, but you're waiting until 70 to collect Social Security, you still have to you still have to you know abide by Medicare rules and the enrollment process. Uh, so that can often be a mistake, especially for those who are you know, who are delaying Social Security, but they're not working. Um, you know, number two, signing up for Part B when you have insurance through work. You're essentially paying double uh, for, for doctor coverage. Now, one thing to note is if you if you don't like your group insurance and you want to enroll in Medicare, you can do that. You can, you can you know, drop your group insurance and then go on to Medicare. So don't think that just because you're working, you have to maintain that group coverage, you know, until you retire. Um, but just know that if you enroll in, in, you know, Part B when you're still working and have group coverage, you're essentially paying, uh, you're paying double. Number three, forgetting about those different uh, enrollment periods, 63 days for Part D and eight months for Part B. I don't know why they just don't make it the same for everything. Uh, number four is not signing up for Parts B and D if you have COBRA or retiree health care coverage. <clears throat> number five, uh, signing up for Part A if you're still working, you have credible coverage. You haven't started Social Security and you want to contribute new dollars to an HSA. And then number six, uh, uh, like Jeremy just thought, you know, asked, is failing to sign up for Medigap during that six-month guaranteed insurability period. So those are some, you know, they're not all encompassing uh, mistakes to avoid, but I would say probably the, the you know, key six to, you know, 13 different mistakes here. <clears throat> all right. Final kind of component here is just the solvency of the bankrupt, you know, Medicare system. It's, it's all over the news. Um, you know, there's things that can be done, but just know that, you know, like we said, uh, costs are expected to grow, you know, from now until forever into the future, uh, largely due to an increase in number of beneficiaries and per capita healthcare costs. <clears throat> so the, you know, the new probably the population of, of those entering into the Medicare system, plus many of those other factors that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, medical technology and, and so forth. Now, I think, you know, I know they revised the, the Social Security Fund, but, um, you know, Medicare bankruptcy, the trust fund itself depleted by 2026 doesn't necessarily mean an immediate or drastic cut to Medicare, uh, you know, or increase your cost. Medicare Part A, like I mentioned at the beginning, is, is 
you know, primarily funded through payroll tax. Um, and then for parts B and D is primarily funded through general tax revenue and, and uh, premiums for those components of Medicare. So, you know, the key concept or the key takeaway is, you know, focus on what you can control. Um, you know, choose the right path for you based on your medical needs, uh, you know, whether that's Medicare supplement or a Medicare Advantage plan. <clears throat> Don't set it and forget it. You know, we've got resources here at, at Raymond James, just, uh, you know, just for being clients. It doesn't cost you anything additional. I've got some information here on the next slide, but, um, you know, don't set it and forget it. Utilize that, you know, that professional help. And then, you know, behavior modification, right? They, remember in retirement, um, try to keep an active lifestyle and utilize healthy habits. So that way you're, you're, you're preventing, you know, the healthcare needs before they become, uh, you know, a concern. So, you know, again, like I said, we've got a resource, uh, you know, available to Raymond James, that's a company called Health Plan One. <clears throat> They're really unbiased. They help discuss your healthcare needs and provide suitable options. Um, you know, they'll evaluate the plans available in your area and the pricing to help with the enrollment and the billing and even you know, support uh, after the fact. So we've got really highly rated reviews on them. Like I said, it doesn't, doesn't cost uh, uh, you or the advisor or anything. Uh, H, you know, HP1, they just get compensated uh, based on the sale of an insurance product. So um, I thought I had their number here. Uh, here it is. Yep. So here's their, their dedicated number. Um, you can call them with your advisor or, you know, on your own, you know, let them know you're uh, a Ram James client. And uh, again, these calls, when you're looking at Medicare insurance, they can last for several hours, especially if you and your spouse are, are looking to enroll at the same time. You know, the good news is you don't have to do it all in one marathon phone call. They'll, they'll assign you a healthcare coordinator. You'll, you'll answer a lot of discovery type questions. You know, who are your doctors? Uh, you know, who are your pharmacy? What, you know, what, uh, what are your financial capabilities type of thing? So they, you know, they can work with you to split that up over many different, many different phone calls. So, yep, yeah, that, that's, that really wraps up the presentation, uh, you know, about an hour. Um, hope to, to really show you the Medicare system, your coverage options, as well as you know, kind of clarify some of the noise when it comes to which path, you know, what are your two paths to choose from. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over, see if we have any questions and, and go from here. That's great, Tim. <clears throat> Thanks so much. Um, real quick plug for HP1. Um, I've been a part of the, as advisors, we, as I mentioned before, we don't get involved and in, we don't sell Medicare plans. We don't have anything to do with it. We allow the experts to handle that, but I've been involved in some of the calls. I know Deb has as well, had some clients that got help from HP1 and um, have nothing, heard of nothing but the highest remarks. And a lot of people come back and say that they couldn't have gotten through it without them. So there's, again, there's no, no bias or influence from us in any way other than being a part of Raymond James. That's why we're here is the resources we have access to. And Raymond James has made that connection and, and uh, you know, they just do a great job. So if you have questions, um, I wouldn't hesitate to, to give them a call. I do have one question from Dean. He turned 65 in February, he plans to continue working after 65. And he's wondering, he does have medical coverage at work. What form do I need to complete to defer the Medicare coverage or does he do it online? So a couple of you know, clarifying points on that. Nothing has to be done to defer Medicare, right? What's going to happen is once you retire and you, you, you know, your, your group insurance is going to issue a termination of coverage letter, typically anywhere from 30 to 60 days before you, you, know, before you leave the company. That termination of coverage letter you'll provide to Medicare as essentially proof that you maintain creditable coverage so that way, when you enroll, you're not charged any penalties. So it's not like you have to be proactive and, uh, uh, you know, defer the coverage. You have to, you, it's more of a reactive thing in that you, you have to provide that, that credible coverage letter. Now, if for some reason you were automatically enrolled because of Social Security or whatnot, you, there's, a, there's termination request letters, and they can be accessed online. I think Part A is like 17, is Form 1763. Uh, to disenroll and then part B, I think you can use the same form. But th again, those are more for disenrollment versus deferment. You don't have to do anything to defer coverage. Okay, great, thanks. And so uh, we really appreciate everybody uh, being here tonight. 
And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to your financial advisor, whether it's me, Jeremy, or Chris, we'd be happy to connect you with HP1. You can do it on your own. Or if you do have any questions, how this works with your social security benefit, that type of thing, um, we're here to help you. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I think this wraps it up. This will be available for replay on our website at potomacfinancialgroup.com. Uh, I'm gonna guess in a week or so, maybe two weeks. So feel free to look at that. If you have any friends, uh, coworkers who might benefit from watching that, send them to the website as well. Hey, That's Deb, it. real quick. David raised his hand. Um, I'm guessing he has a question. Are we Can we allow that? Or do we have to type it in the, the Q&A? There's an allow to talk. I don't know if you had it enabled or not. Uh, let's see. David, put your question in the Q&A if you can real quick. <laughs> Yeah, I just lowered everyone's hands, <laughs> so you can try that. Uh, I don't know how to enable him to speak. A lot of talk. Okay, Dean, it's Dean. We want. Uh, no, David. David. Yeah, I can. I can click it. Also, you want me to click it? Yeah. If you see that, okay. I don't see his first name. David. Um, oh, right there. I'm hoping you. We have you on here. Can you? Can you talk? No, it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, maybe he's just late to raise his hand. Oh, yeah. Say his audio works. <laughs> now, it yeah, might be from that earlier. No question, thanks. Okay, we're all good. He just wanted to wave, wave goodbye, maybe, so. <laughs> well, everyone can wave goodbye if they would like. Um, but if we don't have any more questions, I guess we can wrap this up. Again, really thank good. you, Tim. I really appreciate you uh, joining us. We all do. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. David, thank you. Yes. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.